He was the epitome of chaos, the ultimate duality of everything great and everything wrong at the same exact time. He was a prisoner sitting behind his desk watching a teacher on a chalkboard in which he had no relation. He was, and he still is, somebody who had every opportunity to be great, but unfortunately his life did not allow him to do so. He was the antithesis of Willie Lynch's letter, but the ultimate manifestation of Jim Crow's ideology. Who was he? He was the fire that had forgotten its creative potential, and also the egg cracked into the fire that forgot that even in a new solid form, it was still useful. The egg. To most of us, the egg is just something for food purposes. But at the same exact time, the egg can actually be the life-giving mechanism for a chicken, for example. I think we all know what a chicken is, yes. The chicken spends a certain amount of time inside the egg being nourished and helped by the yolk. The yolk has certain nutrients, certain dynamics that helps the chicken grow. So for a second, let's pause and call ourselves the egg, human beings. On the outside is a shell, what we put onto the world to hide ourselves in certain circumstances. And on the inside is a yolk, which we can call potential, which has an unlimited ability to continue to nurture us should we allow it to continue. So let's crack the egg. And just like that, the potential flows out. However, this was my issue. When I started teaching this semester at an urban high school in New York City, I currently teach 12th grade government, it's an awesome internship, but I got the awesome opportunity to also work in a ninth grade class called the Empowering Males Leadership Class, which takes them, 11 of the school's most underachieving men of color and tries to inspire them. GPAs range from negatives to a 58. These students are in jeopardy of not even making it to the 10th grade, and quite frankly, not many people care for them to make it there. The goal of this class is to inspire them to not only be great in their academics, but in their personal and professional lifestyles. But when I walked into the class about 11 weeks ago, the teacher was frustrated and didn't know what to do. He couldn't relate to the students. No matter what he tried to do, no matter what mechanism, it just wasn't clicking. And when I tried, quite frankly, it was the same exact thing. They didn't really understand me, or I them. And then one day I'd simply ask them, <laughs> what is it about you all that actually makes you who you are? And the responses I got were, I'm going to die by the time I'm 16. I'm not gonna graduate high school. And mister, why are you even here? You can't even relate to us. And then I took a step back. What would 14 year old Ronald say if this nice little bow tied suited, sophisticated college guy came in and told me how to empower myself? I wouldn't be receptive to it. So I reflected. Now, I remember when I was 14, when my grandfather had passed. And ultimately, my grandfather was the one person that made me everything I am. He challenged me. And in a sharecropping nature in which he grew up, there wasn't such thing as laziness. It was always hard work. An 85 was pathetic, and a 90 was okay, I guess. And had I brought home anything less, that'd be even more of a problem. But one summer, when I was about 12, we spent a lovely summer, eight weeks, in Fairmont, West Virginia, which is in west of nowhere of West Virginia. Each and every single day, I did some type of work, whether it be learning how to crop, learning how to do something to help my grandmother's house out at that point in time. But my grandfather was unique. He loved speaking. He was known to always be long-winded. And so I spent that summer writing with him and learning how to express myself in every which way, shape, and form. And in that summer, I wrote 363 poems, which would later become what I now call monologues. It was amazing to think that this man who was very far removed from me had such a huge impact on how I would learn to express myself. So, after reflecting on that, I went back into the classroom. And I decided for the next nine weeks that I would work with these young men, I would continually sow into them, not the idea of empowerment, but how to give access to their voices. So each week they came in, they were challenged. We look at photos of what people perceive them to be. We even worked it so far to define what masculinity was to them. And after a lot of work, pressure, and oftentimes disappointment, I decided to change it up a bit. They walked into the classroom and I said, today we're gonna write I am statements, where pretty much every monologue I write begins. Really simple formula, I plus am and an affirmative. So for example, I am smart, I am beautiful, I am gorgeous, all statements that can describe oneself. It was amazing to see that within five minutes, the emotional reaction on their faces was intoxicating. 
The same young men who had told me not too long ago that they wouldn't make it to 10th grade or even 16th, to say that the least, were now saying, I'm going to do something. I am somebody. But I didn't do anything. I simply reminded them that their voice was the power that they always had and that no one had the authority, ability, or the right to take that from them. You see, that's the funny thing about spoken word. Its infectious nature gives every single person the ability to express themselves. So, now this is them, about last week actually. They're sitting with other freshmen students that have similar issues with their academics. And this time, they're not just reflecting, they're teaching. As you can see, the young man with the blue hoodie is teaching his classmate how to read a transcript and why it's important to work hard. The man next to him is telling another student why you are important. All things that they already had but forgot that they had because of the, the conditions of the society that they lived in. So, what does a group of 11 young African-American boys have to teach us about anything that applies to you, 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 and the entire world in general? Well, what's the human condition? Oftentimes, the human condition is defined as struggle. And I can't deny that each and every single one of us in this room has gone through some degree of struggle some type of pain, some type of destruction that's affected us in a particular way. However, the struggle is not the important part. It's how you take that experience, manipulate it, and change the world that you're in. How have you used your struggle to redirect something or change someone's life? In this case, these young men had stories that I could not relate to. However, by sharing their stories and sharing their experiences with each other, they moved forward and, rediscu and rediscovered their actual power that's been hidden for a very long time. So, what's the question to end this all off? What can we leave here with? It's not what's gonna work or how did you find out how to empower these young boys from the urban inner city. More so, it's about what can we do to perpetuate this? And as I thought about this question before I came here today, I said to myself, a rabbi actually said it that I've studied a lot. If not me, then who? If not now, then when? And that is the question. If not me, then who? If not now, then when? So using your struggles and using your abilities, don't succumb. You have the inherent human capital to change each and every life you encounter. And it all starts with the egg. Whether you're still in your shell or about to be cracked for someone else's benefit, no matter where your yolk, which is the potential inside the egg, ends up, it still benefits somebody. And that's how you can start. Thank you.